and we're, we're live. Um, welcome to the SOA at Home Festival. Today's session is the Brave New World of Digital Theatre. I'm going to give you a quick intro before handing over to Barney. I'm SOA's events manager, Sophia Jackson, and I've worked with colleagues to program the SOA at Home Festival in response to the global pandemic. I'm also co-administrator of our scriptwriters group. This event is part of our autumn winter season and is a nine week program of online events, which runs until next Thursday, the 10th of December. Here is a bit of housekeeping. Most events are free, but if you can afford to, please consider donating to our author's contingency fund, and we suggest a minimum donation of five pounds. The fund is to support authors in financial difficulty due to the health crisis, and I'll be posting the link in the chat for you shortly. Please use the chat function to interact with us by posing any questions to the panel and for the Q&A, which is taking place in the last 15 to 20 minutes of this session. Your host for today is author and playwright Barney Norris, and fellow panellists are Daniel Evans, Artistic Director of Chichester Festival Theatre, Roger Sola Adjifuaju, and Founder Artistic Director of Utopia Theatre, and Rupert Gould, Artistic Director of Al Media Theatre. And Barney will say a bit more about them shortly. Born in Sussex in 1987, Barney Norris is an award-winning playwright, poem, poet, and essayist, and he grew up in Salisbury. Um, his first novel, Five Rivers, Met on a Wooded Plain, was a Times bestseller, and his second novel, Turning for Home, has recently been published, and his study to Bodies Gone, Theatre of Peter Gill, is the first book-length study of one of contemporary theatre senior artists. He's an associate artist at Oxford Playhouse and the Martin Eslin Playwright in residence at Kebble College. He has also been named as one of the 1,000 most influential Londoners by the Evening Standard. His latest novel is The Vanishing Hours, which was published in July 2019. And I will now be handing over to Barney. Enjoy. Thank you for joining us. Of course, I'd like to begin by reading out similarly beautiful and eloquent biographies of all the other people on this call, but I didn't plan them. So, you know, these three are theatre directors. They do other things too, and that's really exciting. And they've all turned up. Um, sorry, everybody, I love your work and have literally seen it. So that's something, I'm not lying, but you know, um, I can't give you the same kind of detail. Sphere is more rigorous than I, sorry. Um, we have about 45 minutes together um, as a quartet to speak about digital theatre um, and some of the questions which have arisen through this year's um, vicissitudes, uh, at, after which we'll take some questions. I have some questions which people sent in beforehand um, to everybody writing in with your locations, which is lovely. Um, it's very nice to get a portrait of who you all are. Thanks um, from Greece and Cairo and Wiltshire, the best place of all. Um, uh, so, so please put questions in the comments bar as you listen, um, or you know, correctives as we talk utter nonsense. Um, I was just saying to the three of you before we started. Um, I think what I'd like to do with the time we have, if possible, is simply to begin by talking about the work that we've done this year as artists in. The digital space um, that some of which will have been planned, some of which will have happened for other reasons, um, and you know, been invented this year. Um, I'm interested in knowing what problems you encountered in creating digital versions of theatre shows, and whether there are opportunities which struck you as exciting, um, innovations which which occurred through making the work. And then finally, I'm interested in asking about what role you see this space playing next time you don't have to use it um, once it's once it's an opportunity rather than a necessity, if that makes sense to you. Um, so I wonder if we could just start. Um, da Daniel, why don't we start alphabetically? And um, uh, <laughs> simple enough, isn't it? Um, is it possible? for you to talk to us about the digital work that Chichester have ended up doing this year? Yeah, I'll, I'll try. I, I guess the thing that um, we, we, we've done quite a lot of stuff, but maybe I'll just give focus on one example. And so 
when um, we knew that we could start doing theatre again, we decided that we'd programme Sarah Kane's Crave on our main house, in, in, on our main stage, which was um, a, quite an unusual uh, choice in one way, because there was this thought, first of all, that tonally people might want to see something that was uplifting and um, cheery and um, sort of, whoops, there go my bloomers kind of show. And of course, Sarah Kane's Crave is not that. It is, though, thematically, it was, we felt, thematically pertinent because it's about four isolated people wanting to make a connection. And having spent so the majority of the year in isolation, then we felt it might resonate. Um, we set out from the in, from the outset. Um, sorry, that's really bad language. But we we set out <laughs> with the team to have three stages to it. So to to have a theatre version where in person, you know, audiences could come in person at the same time that every performance and we did ten of them would be live streamed. And then we're in the middle now of editing together what we're calling post live. So in the new year, we hope to be um, releasing a kind of uh, a more refined version or edit, perhaps, of the live stream uh, version that was obviously live and now gone. Um, and so it, um, we, we felt like we'd gone from naught to 60 in this organisation in terms of our learning where, where digital was concerned throughout the autumn. It brought us huge challenges, but also, you know, many brilliant things. For example, it was the live stream was watched by um, 5,500 people in 50 countries all over the world. Um, and that was fantastic in terms of reach. Uh, it was a real uh, challenge, I think, for the team to, and actually, Rupert, you'll be interested in this because, of course, Rupert's also a filmmaker, but it's interesting to be asking creative teams to now not just be theatre makers, but also to become film and TV makers. And so, you know, to have that lens and to have it simultaneously, so you're making a theatre piece, but then the knowledge that it's also going to be viewed through a lens or people are going to be viewing it through a tablet or a phone or um, etc. And that we are going to have to make choices about where we ask them to look. Or we're going to, you know, in the theatre, you can choose where you look, but obviously um, on the live stream or the digital element, you can choose where you want the audience to focus. Um, and that was quite, a, you know, quite exhausting, I think, for the team during previews because they were focusing on getting the theatre piece right. We had three previews and they were also at the same time editing and each man getting up early and looking at uh, what, was being, what was filmed and what was edited together. Um, but actually, they rose to the challenge uh, remarkably. So I wondered whether, in terms of innovation going forward, that this kind of hybrid model of theatre and uh, TV stroke film, uh, I think, is actually a really exciting promise ahead of us. Hmm. Um, I want to come back to you on this idea of editing the post live version, um, which is really interesting to me. Um, uh, maybe we can do that in a moment. Um, I think it's always nice if everyone's got to talk out loud, then it feels like it was worth their while turning up and we can relax. So, Modisola, do you want to talk about the show that you've made um, this autumn, which actually is in quite a similar stage almost, although I think you've done that post-edit, but can you talk about the show you've made? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the show that we made, um, here's what she said to me, uh, that show was already built to be live streamed and was already built to be captured way before the lock, way, way before COVID happened. Um, however, haven't had the opportunity to then live stream it. Uh, we then decided to also obviously capture it and edit it and that would be going live on the 1st of December which is tomorrow actually <laughs> um, Good plug. yeah so yeah um, lessons learned yeah I guess the same as some of the things that Daniel's mentioned which is in terms of where you want the audience to focus and all of that work that needs to go into just focusing on the fact that people will be viewing it through a different lens to the lens of people who are in the theatre. Um, ours happened to be captured on the same day when audiences were there. So that in itself is a completely different experience as well. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's... that's Can I just ask quickly, so you were planning to live stream prior to the coronavirus pandemic, um, that's right. which is really interesting to me what was the what was the thinking at that stage behind why you were doing it 
I mean, the thinking at that stage was to do with just creating more access. Uh, mm. we, we know that a lot of um, the people that we create work for um, do not come to the theatre. Well, not, not as many of them come as we would like them to. So part of the idea was to start to create some archive of material, but not only that, to start to live stream uh, so that we can reach more audiences and try to sell theatre to them in a way that would then allow them to maybe see it online and then decide actually, and uh, maybe I'll have a better experience if I see it live. So instinctively you feel like um, it can remove barriers to access, the opportunity to, I feel mixed about this because essentially I do still believe going to a nice building and having a gin is more fun than turning on the laptop. And so I sort of, I always struggle with the access thing, but I do know that, um, most theatre is for people like me so so of course i don't feel any barriers to access i'm posh um and 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 that's a difficult thing isn't it i don't i don't know but di but it does feel like you reach different people does it yes it, uh, we definitely do i mean we reached people from like daniel mentioned we reached people from all over the world people in africa were able to people in america people in the middle east so people that wouldn't ordinarily know about a small company in Sheffield and mm. now aware that Utopia Theatre exists. Mm. So that in itself for us has to be a bonus. Yeah. Uh, Rupert, can you tell us about digital work that the Almeida has been doing this year? Uh, yeah, I can try to. I was just, uh, just on the access point though, I was thinking one of the things I think is really interesting about this year is, um, you know, theatre theater goes are often middle-aged or even older. Um, and I think a lot of the kind of people who have been getting gin and tonics and coming to theatres ha have been the very people who, through shielding or whatever, have been denied access to any kind of live offer. And I, I, I hope there'll be a greater understanding from sort of so-called regular theatre goers that access is is not universal for everybody now and, and that this, this moment will kind of encourage a sort of wider embracing of digital. Um, we, I guess my my... My journey with digital, I think, began weirdly with the sort of um, utopian moment many people look back to, which was the 2012 Olympics. And um, a friend of mine was working on it, and I was really lucky enough to get to go and see the dress rehearsal. And it was so gobsmacking, that opening ceremony that they made. And that I remember on the day it went out, being on Twitter in the different era of Twitter, as it were, and just seeing this live performance happening, but also this incredible community response. It was the first time I really kind of got a sense of how live art can interact with a digital um, sort of debate, for want of a better term. And so I think when we got locked down, I think the thing that I wanted to lean into most initially was something that was interactive. And we came up with loads of different models when we spent ages <laughs> uh, developing a version of Hamlet where each audience member could buy a ticket and they would be given a role uh, and there'd be a professional, uh, someone who played Hamlet before would play Hamlet and you could either be cast as Rosencrantz or Claudius. And then we did another version where the audience member would be Hamlet and all the other actors would be professional. And there were these sort of like punch drunky kind of style online experiences. But I could, we could never get traction on them partly because they felt either too light for the seriousness of the times, maybe speaking a bit to what Daniel's saying, or or that just the planning, we kept thinking, oh, maybe we're gonna reopen, maybe we'll reopen, maybe we'll reopen. And so we'd be making plans, tearing them up, making them, tearing them up. And I think if we'd known how long it was going on, we would have got into that space as more successfully. And we were a bit on our heels with that way. We did, I, I had shot um, a, a sort of onstage capture of Albion, Mike Bartlett's play that we had done, we had filmed in February just before lockdown and was going out for the BBC. And actually I was editing that in the first few weeks of, of lockdown uh, in a sort of empty centre of London. And that went out in the, in the height of the summer. Um, and, and beyond that, we've we had a, a successful digital festival of our young people's companies' work around climate change. That was that was meaningful, and I think probably for us, participation for community groups and, and young young people has been the main reward. Really, from the little tiny ones, sort of six year olds right up, you know, to older groups, that's been great in a participation sense. But in terms of making artworks, we we haven't made very many, and I think that's that's really been we've been cut back to the bone by furlough. I mean, it's been great for us all, but there've been often maybe only two people in the organization at any one point. We are very lucky to be in tech now and opening 
on the third for uh, Nine Lessons and Carols, uh, a show over Christmas. And we will, as with all the work we'll do before Easter, stream that. And we have um, got into that. But, um, you know, I, I think I think the sector would have been so much more creative. And some of, and some people, you know, I really admire what, what Chichester have been able to achieve. Um, if, you know, if we'd known how long it was going to be. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm really interested in the thing you make, the point you make about the use of digital in participation work. Um, you remind me of, um, it's still quite a recent memory for me, the purely getting to stand on the stage where the, where the grown ups stand is one of the most important things that happens in a youth theatre career. And I have felt this year like there is something really democratising about these platforms which we're on now because everything boots up on the same screen. Is that pathetic? There's something amazingly equalising about all of us are um, experiencing stories through the same interfaces, which feels very uh, liberating to me, actually, in terms of the type of the type, uh, the type of attention given to work which might otherwise potentially feel marginal. I don't know. Um, Daniel, can I just ask you about this post-editing thing? So um, my understanding of the way that National Theatre Live capture performances, and, and um, you'll all know this better than me, but it's the one I know. I kind of, I knew Tony Hall when he was setting up the ROH sort of live streams and then I talked to people at NT Live. So in an end on performance, they'll have an eight camera setup and then a camera plot which they're following live. But of course they're capturing an, a great deal more material than uh, than is ever broadcast. There are seven cameras not operative at any one time that's still shooting. And I know when they did the, what was the show at the bridge in the round? Was it the dream they did on NT Live? And that was a 13 camera plot. And so um, it, have you been going into this trying to find alternative takes since putting together the live stream of Crave? Is that, is that been part of the process there? Yeah, certainly. So we were a five camera plot. And um, so we have all the material, the raw footage of, of the five cameras, obviously. And, um, and also we had a brilliant video uh, designer as part of the production, uh, Ravi Dupreeze. And he, um, they, they, they did some pre-recording of, uh, of the actors that they used as part of the production, as part of the design of the production, which was shown on a BP screen at the back. And so um, there, is, there is some overlay that happened, overlaying images and, you know, different cameras and diff uh, some pre-recorded uh, during the live stream. But of course, the ability to accelerate or to uh, exploit that will um, really happen in the post live. So yes, you might choose, actually, I want to come from this angle rather than this angle. Um, but I think more excitingly is how can we um, use the, the base materials that we had as the projected material in the production and really uh, sort of meld that with the performances, the, the then live performances of the actor, which should be quite an exciting process, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Can I ask you a question, Rupert, um, a sort of endless question? Uh, uh, as someone who's directed films, um, I feel like the process Daniel's describing is broadly how movies get edited, but I feel like it must feel infinitely different to do the two. You know, I, I, a, a theatre play as captured is not a film. I, I was really interested to read Mike Bartlett making the point, I think, in The Guardian this year that I, Claudius, is much closer to being a theatre play than uh, you might realise initially watching it. And I think the, there, there are shows which exist in the space in between, but essentially they must be profoundly different things. The way, I don't know, is it the way storytelling happens that's different or the way um, the capturing of images happens? Are you able to express those spaces in your heads for us? <laughs> um, maybe, yeah. I mean, I we we, we did a, a sort of live stream of Rich the Third a few years ago, which is my first experience of a show that I directed just going out live. And I almost found I couldn't watch it going out because it was done. Do you know what I mean? Like you had to accept what you got. And uh, the camera team did a great job on that. But I, 
I almost, I think it's partly my, I find the stuff that I've made on for TV or for film, the, the, the post-production is such a huge part of it. And literally once it's out, even before it's broadcast, I never ever watch it ever again. Whereas the plays that I've made, I go over in my head with affection for the rest of my life. I, it's something about different art forms in a funny way. Um, but I think that, um, I, I guess my experience, and with Albin it was tricky because we had a day of pickups. So we did two live captures on five cameras and then we did a sort of long afternoon of close up pickups, which actually I found really useful just to get tighter onto the eye line and to get closer with the camera for the sort of really intimate moments. And then we had a brief three or four, three day maybe edit process. Um, but I guess what you're doing as a director anyway is you are editing the version that you saw in rehearsal room or on stage for camera. So you're trying to get the shots that are that most represent the psychology and the story that you felt you made through, but the, the making was done in the rehearsal room. Whereas if you're making a movie, you, yes, you have something in your head, of course you do, but really, I, th I think someone once said that it was sort of like the, the pre-production is is the recipe, the the shoot is you go shopping and the, and the editing is when you actually cook. And there is some truth in that. I think you make the story in the edit. Uh, and I haven't I haven't done a piece of digital theatre with that sensibility yet because it requires time and and resources. Yeah, um, Montesola, something I noticed watching your show and which you just mentioned already as well was um, the presence of audience in shots, and I was really interested in this almost as a um, a manners issue. Uh, I feel like there are complex things to look after when you're bringing people into a space knowing that they're going to be shot. Um, I wondered whether you had been retaking anything, whether that, you know, I, 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 whether that people had had to be patient with you on anything like that. And I wondered how you looked after the presence of a live audience in the capture of the show. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is um, it wasn't even something that was considered. <laughs> that, I mean, that's the truth. Yeah, it, it just wasn't considered. Um, it was only afterwards when I started editing that I kind of started thinking about the fact that they were there. But not only were they there, they were there with their mask on. Um, and then I had to try and find the best shots possible where I, I could not have as many of them there as possible um yeah but, but that's that's basically what happened out of interest and I, um i'm seeing other people nodding so maybe there's more to say about this but like would you would you look after that process differently now having done gone through it once definitely yeah definitely <laughs> i think i would I would think about the design, I mean, which is what is so interesting about what Daniel's saying about the whole thinking around the design of it as well, in terms of what you want to put out there. I think because we had planned for it to be captured and live streamed, well, live streamed and then captured for archival purposes, we hadn't planned that it would be something that would become a a permanent thing in the way that it is post COVID. Well, post the lockdown. Mm. Um, sorry. Funny, no, just to Daniel, to sorry. Um, <laughs> Moji, you're slightly frozen on my screen. I don't know if that's true for everyone, but we can still there? hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Moji Soda, can you oh, hear thanks. us? You might want to uh, duck out and come back in, possibly. Yes, um, I might have to. <laughs> Um, so, see in a second. <laughs> I was just going to add, Barney, I think that oh, one of the things that we found, because we, we did have the debate with ourselves about whether or not, um, why, why live stream? So why why do why not sort of capture and then spend the time you know sort of doing something much more intricate, and we found and I think actually our friends at the old Vic, uh, you know, found this too that there was something about the liveness that the fact that you know one of the actors um, Jonathan Slinger in Crave did uh, we did one performance in the afternoon uh, no no it was an evening performance and I just happened to go around the dressing rooms afterwards to check in with the actors. And he'd literally just come off the phone to his American agent who had watched the live stream. And his American agent couldn't get over the fact that he, you know, 
across the sea had was speaking to Jonathan, who you know five minutes ago had been performing Sarah Kane's Crave live for him, you know, in that beamed into his um, into his apartment in New York. So there's something I think about the liveness of things that is, um, and that's where of course the audience comes in. Although we, for us, um, uh, the the lockdown 2.0 came in the middle of our run. So the actors did four, four, five performances to an audience and then five performances to an empty auditorium. And actually, you know, both were interesting because of the nature of the play. You know, it's not necessarily a laugh out loud comedy, although I argue it is quite funny in places, um, but you're not expecting big belly laughs. So actually that kind of play um, was fine in an empty auditorium and actually rather poignant. Uh, particularly particularly poignant for me watching the actors bow to an empty aud or auditorium and reading some of the reactions from people who have who did watch it live and said you know that was a poignant moment for them or people felt like they were getting up in their living rooms and clapping you know to the screen which is strange but there's definitely something about the feeling that you're watching something that is happening somewhere in the world at this point so we're still having a kind of communal experience um, and we might be, you know, on a WhatsApp group or we might be on Twitter commenting to each other, you know, in different continents. Um, so we're having some sort of communal experience, which is not necessarily the same as being shoulder to shoulder with someone, you know, or socially distanced shoulder to shoulder to someone wearing a mask in space. But nevertheless, is a new sort of digital way of um, experiencing something together at a distance. I, that's very interesting. I was having a conversation just yesterday about... Um why and i'm sure i've missed the masterpiece and there is one but why there hasn't been a good vr show yet um and you know because i think five years ago i went to the kind of workshop the nt and microsoft were doing saying look what you can do look what you can do and i just thought oh i feel a bit seasick and i want to go home and um I, I, everything i've seen that makes that makes me feel a bit seasick and want to go home and i think there is something I was really interested in the context of McBurney. So Simon's work is a sustained fascination with 80s cutting edge tech. So like if, if, you, if you think the world is in 1985, then he's a really cutting edge innovator of how to splice cassettes together and whatever. Um, and I don't know how many equivalent artists are um, really fascinated with the cutting edge of technology right now and i wonder whether that is because quite a lot of the cutting edge strikes me as a slightly atomizing energy i think there's a lot of isolation that comes from our playstations and our i, mean, I haven't got a playstation but you know um i think you sit on your own um and you know or, or whatever it might be putting your headphones on and not being in a space and so on and so what you say about liveness is interesting to me because i I can't understand why there hasn't been a really good VR version of Synecdoche New York or whatever it might be, you know, that there surely are stories and someone trendier than us will tell us about the really great video game that we're all missing, but <laughs> I, believe them. I don't believe them. It's not true. Um, have, have you, have, has anyone here played with VR or AR or anything like that? Something. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> no, no results yet. Well, well I, I think, uh, you know, um, yeah, no, I mean, A, it's really expensive and it takes such a long time, which is really hard when you've you know, got a day job. Um, but also, I suppose there are, you know, maybe not VR, Barney, but there are, you know, elements in, um, I've recently been sort of scouring the internet, looking at videos of how those shows like um, American... Uh, there's what is it America's got talent or Britain's got talent or, or even strictly are, are really using video and combined live dancing and or live singing and video in a really interesting way with their audience well it was with their audience present and actually some of the work that goes on there is sort of hinting at the future I think okay um that there mm. is a a hybrid there mm. um just because you talked about money I I do have another thing that I'm interested to ask you all about and then I should probably start turning to the questions and corrections for my lies sorry anchor I'll I'll acknowledge I'll acknowledge it later um uh that people are asking in the margin um I do feel like oh and I need to ask you generally um 
how you think you might use this medium going forward um, when it feels less of a necessity, although it's so interesting to hear that actually for two of you, you really were planning to do Albion and here's what she said to me already. And so, so perhaps necessity has played less of a role than I thought in this year for you. Um, I feel like the economics is going to be a really significant barrier to the development of this space because I don't quite see how it ever really... I don't know how you could ever pay for a show that was only live streamed uh, because, but maybe I'm naive. Maybe that's wrong. I think you could. I, I think, I think the, um, I, I saw some numbers uh, or someone told me some numbers the other day for this, the streaming of Amelia, which I think was only an archive recording, uh, which did incredible business from what I'd heard. And, you know, they had, I, I've been on calls where I didn't, where they're, the others have as well, where the sort of orthodoxy is it's an intensification of the star system digital, but that, that basically more, it relies on the profile of the performer more even than theatre does, which kind of makes sense at one level because you're trying to reach a very potentially global audience. Uh, and so if you have Andrew Scott or somebody in the show, then it's going to draw on that. And that's great, although also probably a little bit depressing for those of us committed to non-star driven work or, or new work or whatever. Um, but you know, Amelia, the player was the star, and uh, and and the reputation of the show, and uh, and it's obviously a global reputation built over a period of time, and I think that's really exciting if that's the case, because I think you could certainly look at shows that maybe have some capitalisation through their live element, but really, you know, in fact, we're looking at a big community project actually for March, which in fact, literally I just come off a call from the budgeting. And it's you know it's six figure sum for us to invest in for for what was really only going to be in terms of public facing work a week's work. I mean it's a huge number of participants and it's it's uh, very important for us to do and we're very excited about it. Now if that could then go on and have a reach outside, if, the, if, if we're social distancing at the Almeida, that's probably not more than a hundred people in per performance. If we can reach thousands, tens of thousands, hundred thousands, or it, it, beyond that, not only is that increasing value, but it actually points a model for to, for that kind of work to be really productive. So, so I, you know, I, I think that's that's really positive. And NT Live have actually, it's been huge revenue. The NT, have, I think, have, they, they hit their development targets six months into their year. That's with no work, um, you know, which shows you how which is, it's not just the money that you get from people who might pay to come and see the work, but it's about the feeling of goodwill it, it gives towards the venue. That, that, that um, is really important for culture. Okay. Well, that's reassuring. <laughs> um, I wonder if I could ask some questions that I've been sent um, in advance, uh, if that's all right with you all. Um, and then there I have some questions in the margin to come to as well. Um, Lynn Sigovsky, um, who, hello, Lynn, you're right, you're also in the margin. Um, yeah, I think this is interesting. Um, maybe we've talked about this already, but but just to interrogate it a little further, Lynn asks, um, I'm interested to know whether panellists foresee a future in which digital theatre coexists with live theatre as two associated with separate media. I think we've talked about that and said probably yes. Um, how will you seek to help the public understand the former is not a replacement for the latter is an interesting question. Um, do you feel like that's a challenge um, or... Um, I, 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 sorry, just a, a brief, a brief sort of, in a way, um, preface to the to any answer. The World Health Organization. I don't know if people know this, but the uh, World Health Organization recently did a study that categorically shows that one's T cells get a boost when you're watching live theatre, when you're there present, or live music, um, in a way that you don't get when you're watching something on a tablet. Mm. So I think, um, I mean, while we're not using that study, you know, well, we're obviously not at the moment because we can't, uh, you know, get large audiences in. But um, I think the reaction from our audience here in, in when we've had people in to do test events or whatever, we've taken Q&A is people saying, um, actually, I don't want to watch it through a computer screen. I want to I want to come, you know, I, so, it's, you know, please don't please don't stop making it live. And of course, we're not. Um, but my answer to hers was, well, no, you know, the, the idea is, is that you get a choice. And um, and people when anti life first started, people thought, well, is it going to you know dissuade people from coming? Well, no, it's actually done the reverse. Mm. Mm. 
I think, yeah, I think it has just driven people into the theatres, hasn't it? And I mean, much slowly, you've also talked about it as a, a lobbying document, um, like digital capture as a means of creating new um, booking opportunities. I, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yes, I mean, I think it, it's been a means of also reaching audiences who wouldn't ordinarily want to come to the theatre. But I'll have to say that um, some of the experiences in terms of the live streaming and the capture has been that not having audiences there has also had its impact because there's a certain sense of energy that, especially with the kind of show that I make, which is very much a very kind of audience participatory piece of theater. So without the audience there, there's something missing from that story. In any case, there's something missing from the storytelling. So I think it's in that respect that I would, I would be slightly cautious about the type of work that I do in the future. I would only want to do work that I feel there's a way of marrying that kind of live theatre with digital technology, really thinking more about the work uh, instead of just kind of just thinking about the live streaming or the capturing of the work. Because I think we need to start thinking more kind of in depth about how we marry the two worlds, really. Actually, that does remind me um, something. I can't remember what Daniel said about bloomers earlier, um, but it strikes me that actually it might just be a coincidence. But we're, I'm talking to three people who didn't make um, kind of big populist choices, I would argue, with the with the programming. Um, actually, in terms of the. Well, well, you, you program plays, good plays. That was the, the centre of what you've been putting out digitally this year. Um, are there, would you, do you think about programming different, would you think about programming differently in the digital space on the, on the basis that certain types of work work better, but also would you work, would you think differently about what taste is for someone in their own house rather than someone who wants to come out to the theatre? Does that, is there a change there? Hmm. I think, yeah. Mad, I'm guessing, but I have a um, a theory that that great stage work uh, rewards acting that is um, at or faster than the speed of thought, um, and um, particularly in classical work, and that great screen acting is often luminous, slower than natural thought, like Marlon Brando or Judi Dench on screen. And I, I think it's a real challenge. I think that's the biggest challenge about putting a camera on a stage performance is is marrying those two imperatives. And I think there are certain kinds of texts that um, struggle in that way. Um, I, I think this is probably a really limited thing. I don't mean anywhere near as reductive as it sounds, but but I think we are used to naturalism on screen. You know, as in it, 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 it we're, the verite of naturalism is part of screen. So. I haven't seen Ian's check off the Vanya that was had such great reviews, but you, I can imagine that sort of material is particularly, and of course, actually Albion was in a Chekhov, Chekhovian idiom as well. Um, obviously, Crave much more theatrical, but but still sort of intimate, I guess, in a way, or kind of up close. Um, you know, it's why I think um, a friend of mine was in, I think, Peter Brook's Hamlet, and you know, they'd done that for two years, huge success, and he said when they came to film it, they put nearly an hour and a half on it, on, on, on the running time, just, and I, I think I think things like Shakespeare are really challenging on, on screen, um, but, um, but in terms of repertoire, I mean, I think that what is exciting is the space for new plays. I, I feel like that that is, you know, theatre's uniqueness in some ways is the fact that it can respond immediately, quicker than TV, because the resources, you know, if you can get a camera on something, some actors in a room, you do that, you know, in a, you know I think the Royal Courts project, um, based on the living newspaper was, was was looking at that and I, I think that could be really exciting people having you know we live in this the great offer of theater is bringing us together they're you know, bringing us together in a room so we're not divided and social media and all these other things divide us and i think we have to hold on to that in the digital space as well but that, that somehow the work can look to build bridges and pull us together and give us a sense of community i certainly think i own um writing primarily about rural communities where um, the Tory majority is unassailable. Um, the, my understanding of theatre was always, this is a forum in which you might be able to 
exert some form of of influence on people's thinking in a way that the conventional political sphere never does and the limit to that is always that actually people are off in their little villages they don't want to come in and they don't want to see it and so there is it, it does seem like a breakthrough for me to to being able to speak directly to people that feels quite exciting to me um i would say um i have a very complex question for you all i want to flag in advance that we're not going to understand this question from adam Somerset, <laughs> who is cleverer than us um and who would like to ask Maybe we, again, maybe we've talked about this, and I apologise if we have, uh, but he specifically asked, how do you address the physiological and time-space disjunctions between digitally mediated and analogue representations of performance? I'm sure you've all got that. I won't repeat it. Um, following up, he explains uh, the eye has a wider field of vision than the camera, um, and also that uh, stage experience is live and film experience is at some level not, it's edited. I mean, uh, my equivalent experience, I remember Michael Frayne saying to me, the difference between a play uh, and a novel is in a novel, you can tie the hero to the train tracks, uh, walk away for half an hour, talk about the history of rope and how knots were invented, <laughs> come back and the train hasn't got any closer. And in a play, the bloke's dead. And they, I think that might be what Adam is talking about. I'm not sure. Um, but how you navigate those differences um, I don't know whether anyone has a startling insight on that that they haven't already offered. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I do, but 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 I but I I, I guess one what, um, I completely uh, uh, recognise the the differences and the challenges. I suppose I'd come at it from a slightly different point of view and say, you know how do we find ways to make the both both media speak to one another and and that might be i think an interesting innovation going forward is what happens if there's a theater piece that starts online and then you come into the space and experience something live and then go away and experience some you know a follow up that's you know or how do you for example something that we thought about is if we were doing something live and uh, on uh, something digitally and then putting it out sorry this isn't answering the question at all. <laughs> it is <laughs> but, I, but I, i'll finish it which is um, right. you know could could you could you bring liveness to the digitalness of things so for example could you send things out physical things to everyone in advance so that if you know if it's a um i suppose rupert was talking about this about interactivity you know, could you, if you, if there was a play, if you're watching, you know, say Tom Cruise's cocktail, could you send out the ingredients of a cocktail that at certain point, or, you know, Emma Rice was doing this with, with uh, Romantics Anonymous, you know, get your, get, book a ticket and get some chocolate. And then during the evening, they tell you now open your chocolate and now eat it. So again, this sort of, I mean, you know, there, there are surely more elaborate ways to, um, to bring, to have both media uh, speak to one another, I think, mm -hmm. coming down the lens. But sorry, I, I haven't um, addressed the technical issues of the question, sorry. No, but I think what you're talking about is really cool. And I also think, um, uh, I mean, the thing that really frustrates me about plays is that no one ever does them like in Stonehenge or up a hill or in a river or anything, you know, and actually in, you know, in five years, I mean, you go to Snowden and the Wi-Fi is amazing, right? Because they boost mm -hmm. it for the tourists. You could watch a play on your phone or with your head like up snowed and that'd be fine. Some parts of the country know, but actually the the possibility to not just be a passive consumer, but maybe to use storytelling to inhabit a landscape differently is coming, isn't it? I think that is out there and, and quite exciting, um, which would be quite a cool thing to do. Um, because otherwise we just do plays in theatres and they're fine, but you know, we need them all. Um, I'd like to just slightly adapt the question I've been sent by Julia Pascal, um, just because we have covered it and I'm third time round, I'm gonna get better at clocking that. Um, why, why would a, a writer, would you encourage a writer um, to try and create a play that could be digitally streamed rather than to try and create a film. Um, what is the reason to inhabit that space rather than try and write a screenplay? It's a good question. When you talked about the theatricality of your work. I wonder whether there's just something in that that um, 
film is a different language that embraces naturalism in a different way. Is that to me, Ben? Oh, anyone? No, no, Go no, on. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I guess it depends on how that technology is being used. For example, everybody has a mobile phone. And if part of the audience that you're trying to reach is an audience with mobile phones, for example, I guess you could ask a writer to create a show that is dealing with a particular issue, but that mm -hmm. people would only have to engage with it through mobile phones. So I think it will be in those kind of situations that I would definitely want to commission a writer to, to, to write a play about, to write a play that is dealing with those two mediums. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I have a very practical question here from Chris Worthington, which I think might come from a specific um, production that he's struggling to make or something. Uh, how can we socially distance the actors in a play with seven actors? Um, I, I I imagine there are very complex games one plays. I remember reading somewhere that if you get 20 people in a room, it becomes odds on that two of them share a birthday or so. I think magic things happen in rooms. You can make it work. But but how have you all got around social distancing or have you gone for bubbling or what? On stage? I mean, the show, I don't know what you guys do with the Cray. We, we're um, we're testing our actors twice a week, and the, the stage management, the people who are in the room, um, we're trying to put protocols in, like not travelling at rush hours and things like that, to try and minimise risk. Um, we are socially distancing this, the show we've got at the moment on stage, and I think probably will the next one as well. Um, so that literally means no more than five people on stage at any moment. Right. Um, I mean, of course, one of the things that Phil, I mean, there's actually a rather good um, friend of mine, the showrunner on EastEnders, and that they've been particularly inventive and early on in like how they were able to play with depth of field and perspex screens and stuff to, to, to create the sense of proximity on screen. And that's one of the great things that camera can do is it can cheat or make or cheat your eye anyway. So you, so you can pull people together. Um, but um, it was interesting actually, just to on that EastEnders thing actually, but I know when they came back from lockdown, the audience group that was slowest to return of the 16 to 30 year olds, I think. And I do wonder whether this year will have accelerated people's, um, that generation's life on the internet and on, on different sorts of platforms and on the mobile phone. And just going back to Julia's question, I, you know, I, I, I suppose I might um, channel a writer towards material that might aim to a Generation Z kind of subject matter. I think young adult uh, work, I think, can really ha have some exciting opportunities through um all sorts of digital platforms i would also just say actually i think the single single greatest asset of digital is in the education space you know just to see people who are studying drama i mean it's it's withering on schools anyway the government doesn't seem to want to invest in it but to be able to put work out for schools and and people get more access to creativity at that age i think that's that's the single greatest win um can i ask a question um of of, of you all um, from Helen Farrell, um, who writes, I'm a captioner with stage text, and I'm interested to know whether and at what stage disabled access is being considered for digital theater. How's the industry meeting this need? Um, how, I, I wonder if anyone has been, been, been grappling with this recently. Yeah, it's super important, yeah. isn't it? And it's it's as we know, we we um, we talk a lot about how we uh, believe in inclusion, and in fact, you know, it's often it, particularly when uh, things are tight, or that you know you feel up against the wall. It's often one of the things, the first things to go. And so, um, yeah, one of the things that we have felt that it, you know, were we to do this again, and we will is to, you know, we have to find a way, and in fact, we will find a way in the post live, but how do we find a way to live stream and either caption or um, use BSL? Um, mm. So uh, yeah, it's it's a really important, um, really important factor. Yeah, and there's, pro I mean, I mean, well, yeah, there are things that, there are amazing things that I've learned. So for example, Zoom has a, um, a transcript function on it so you can you can record okay. it on zoom and then it gives you the exact script well not exact but more or less you know so there's interesting technologies that we're also exploring at the moment and how we can transfer them to theater 
But of course, I imagine for all of you, uh, signed performances and captioned performances are part of every production you make. And so where there's a where there's a relationship between a live performance and a streamed performance, you have the raw materials. And so it's a case of finding a technological way to um, present them on a screen, and maybe as may, maybe as an optional button, or maybe as a specific alternative track or a specific live performance or whatever that might be. I suppose you can, those kinds of options exist, don't they? Yeah. Um, thank you, that's really interesting. Uh, um, can I just say something about the previous question, which is about socially distanced actors? I think there was a moment right. quite early on in spring when I think all the artistic directors were, were trying to make lists of all the actors who lived with other actors. <laughs> <laughs> And so I think we were all trying to, in fact, we, we are going to do a play where uh, we have two actors in the cast, out of two out of four, and two of them are in a relationship. So, you know, that's, that's, that's one way. <laughs> that's very good. <laughs> um, Louis Greenberg writes with a technical question. Um, I don't know whether any of you will have engaged with this. Um, do practitioners have tips on industry standard software for DIY, guerrilla, digital production and editing? Um, are there any go-to links or resources for starting or solo producers? Um, I wonder what software you've been using or whether you paid a grown-up. Okay. Well, solo, you know what, you, um, what kind of equipment you were using to put together the show? Uh, we paid somebody to do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> our partners were amazing i give them a shout out yeah, the umbrella rooms the guys at the umbrella rooms were really fantastic and then the platform that we used to do crave on uh, was a platform in new york called book ticks i think it's i think it's something like that it's called and um they were fantastic also they it was the first time they were streaming in the uk because they normally do stuff just in the us they're based, based in new york um and yeah, it, they made the whole thing really simple and easy. I recommend them. Okay. Yeah, and I would recommend Pilot Theatre too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, Daniel, I have a question specifically for you, it says, from Daniel Hahn. Hi, Daniel Hahn. Nice to see you. Um, this is a programming question, perhaps mostly Daniel. I was one of the people with an end of week Crave ticket who was sadly robbed of the experience by the lockdown. Or oh, I haven't read to the end of this, by the way. I'm sorry if it turns into a horrible attack. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that was exciting about the prospect was specifically seeing it on the main stage. Yeah. I may be wrong, but it's a play I'd assume in all times would be in your 300-seater rather than 1,200-seater. I wonder if the necessary changes to our situation, not just having supplementary online audiences, but also distance audiences, in which you need to sell maybe 250 tickets to make that huge, amazing space full, it might change what sorts of plays can be put. It wasn't an attack. Uh, what yeah. sorts of plays can be put on in what spaces? Yeah, it's a really interesting situation we're in because um, actually full for us now in the main house, because our main house is 1,300 seats. Actually, the new rules in the tier system means that we can go to 50%. So we can actually get 650 people in our main auditorium at a social distance, which is amazing. Wow. Um, Crave was initially meant to be in our Spiegel tent, which was 150 seats. And so suddenly for the creative team to then be thinking they were going to be performing in, a, in a, an auditorium of 1,300 was, you know, took a bit of getting used to, I think. But again, the nature of the play and of course the way uh, Alex Loud designed it and Tanuka Craig directed it meant that it felt completely at home. And actually it's opened up for us at this moment in time anyway, and especially for the next six months when actually our our income targets from where you know ticket tickets income from tickets are in question we can only budget for us you know for half the house or less so it's giving us an opportunity to think outside the box about what plays could sit in there given the crave worked so well so um yeah we're hoping to do a bit more experimentation over the next six months yeah i think it's a great opportunity actually again it's a new plays opportunity i, I, I um Peter Gill said to me once, he just thinks everything would work better in the Littleton. You know, everything just direct everything in the Littleton and that will be best. Oh. And most plays can't ever do that, really. Um, don't know if he's right, by the way, but, you know. And um, and I think I think there is something quite exciting. Um, the most difficult and strange journey that a playwright makes is from writing for, you know, the bush, where really you only need to write um, words to writing for, you know, um, 
the mid scale where you need to write bodies and you need to write kinetic energy and that uh force forcing that shift onto text which might otherwise have happened in smaller spaces is a very interesting experiment whether it works or not um we're coming to the end of our time i feel i should acknowledge to anchor Ludica, a former national theater live producer that i've been lied to about how many cameras nt live used to do the dream at the bridge sorry i lied in turn this is how things get out into the world it's awful i'm sorry um so it just remains for me to thank you all for spending an hour in my company today and the company of everybody listening. It's so kind of you um, and hugely appreciated by everybody at the Society of Authors because you're wonderful people and you've done wonderful things this year in the most difficult, unpleasant year to make work ever. Um, so thank you very much for talking to us. Um, I have an outro which I'm meant to do. Uh, I've lost it off my phone, so I'll vaguely try and remember it. I'll say that tomorrow, there is another gig, everyone, that the Society of Authors is doing on this platform at a similar time with a different human being. And if you go on the Society of Authors website, you will be able to find out who and when that is. Um, uh, it's societyofauthors.org forward slash events. I do remember that much. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Really grateful to you. And um, see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Nice to see you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.